the last lecture of the 36th Winter Lecture Series. My name is Sharad Seth, and I'm a member of the Winter Lecture Series Planning Committee. We are forced to offer this lecture over the internet due to the unusual and troubling circumstances of the coronavirus. I'd like to thank Brandon Evans on our committee who came up with this webinar idea and worked out all the technical details with our speaker to make it a reality. And thank you, Jean Hems, at the Unitarian office to keep all of you informed of the many schedule changes we had to make. Before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to acknowledge that we are sponsored by the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. We partner in this endeavor with Ollie, and we are very grateful for the continued funding from Humanities Nebraska. Our speaker today, William Avilas, is a professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. His research focuses on Latin America and explores how capitalist globalization is linked to a range of issues associated with civil military relations, political violence, and democracy. His work also involves examining US drug war policies in the region. His books include Military Power and Globalization in the Andes, published in 2011, and The Drug War in Latin America, Hegemony and Global Capitalism, published in 2017. In his talk today, he will focus on Venezuela. You'll recall that Venezuela had an attempt at uprising in April of last year, with an outcome that's still uncertain. The title of his talk is Venezuela's Bolivarian Revolution and the Persistence of Authoritarianism. Over to you, Will. Thank you so much, Sharad, for that introduction. And um, much, much thanks, Brendan, David, John, Jean, and Dick, and Sharad, as well as all the members of the United Church of uh, Lincoln for this invitation and for facilitating this uh, Zoom lecture. It's a real pleasure uh, for me to, to present, even if it's, uh, it's from a distance, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting uh, into our, our discussion. Um, basically, when I was asked to, um, to give this talk, it, it was brought to my attention to do a discussion on the uh, rise of the Latin American West uh, with, uh, with a focus upon Venezuela. And I, I came to the conclusion, given the, the decline of the Latin American West over the last oh, four or five years, that in terms of being a presence within the region, it might make sense to actually look a little bit more in detail in a very kind of relevant and ongoing puzzle that exists in Latin American politics. And that's the case of Venezuela. And this question of how this authoritarian regime uh, continues to survive in its crisis. So what I would like to do is talk a bit about uh, this, this case, a little bit about the, the crisis, a little bit about why it represents a, a puzzle. And, and maybe share, I'm going to share with you a few of the ideas that have been presented as to why, despite all the challenges that I assume many of you are aware, the uh, non-democratic system that is led right now by Nicolas Maduro uh, continues to, to plug on and, and move forward. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get started with uh, this talk. I'm going to get the full screen, hopefully, and it's slowly getting that. There it goes. And uh, let's begin. So obviously, country of Venezuela, I was there um, some years ago, 2008, and um, doing some work on my, my second book, dealing with civil military relations. And that was Will, William, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt for a moment. Uh, people are having difficulty hearing you. Oh. Can you hear me, Brendan? Uh, but it sounds very distant. Do, do you have a headset that you might be able to use? or? That's better now. Okay, so I think what I need to do is just maybe speak a little bit louder and uh, closer to the uh, to the computer. So sorry about that. Um, I'm at home, so my technology is also a work in progress. <laughs> so I, I, I'll continue then. Yes, continue. Okay. That sounds uh, better. 
you. So sorry about that. Hopefully you all can hear me uh, better now. Uh, so basically I want to deal with the, with the crisis, like as I mentioned, um, this is a part of the puzzle, right? How does this government continue despite this? Despite this hyperinflationary uh, situation that the, the country has been going now for multiple, multiple years, uh, an inflationary spiral uh, that's been associated with extreme shortages of uh, basic goods, as this grandmother and her granddaughter um, are shopping or attempting to shop, or these uh, regularly appearing lines in different parts of the country where people are just trying to find that product, that commodity, whether you're talking about basic food, uh, toilet paper, uh, items that, that we would, would take for granted um, being uh, in short supply. Uh, that, this hyperinflationary crisis um, is also being coupled with a real uh, decline, a real collapse of, of, of GDP. And in terms of the economy in the last four or five years, uh, some estimates shrinking about 40%. Uh, in 2020, uh, some are suggesting by 2020, we're about a 50% uh, reduction uh, in GDP. Uh, obviously, issues of basic medicines uh, have been difficult to obtain. Infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates have been increasing. Um, imports of goods and services have fallen by a staggering 81%. Um, so this is all, again, this has been in the news, but we're, I assume many people are aware of this, this issue uh, and this challenge, and at least fundamentally, this is what has led to this collapse. There are other factors that, that are at play, but fundamentally, the fact that we have a, a country that was so dependent upon the, the success of one commodity, uh, that is obviously the case of oil, I think that as well as the oil. I was thinking today, hmm. They had gotten some bills from the guy at Wellington Greens. And, uh, you know. So, <laughs> so it has imploded, right? So this has been a major problem. And so the Venezuela must import uh, all of its basic goods, food commodities, a uh, whole range of items. It's absolutely dependent upon getting hard currency, getting dollars in order to import those products uh, for uh, its society. That's a fundamental factor underlying the shortages. Other factors involve a relatively corrupt exchange rate system in which you have a various corrupt importers who are pledging they're going to import one item after another and uh, simply refusing to. Or, or maybe importing some goods and then trafficking them to Colombia. This has contributed to shortages. Uh, finally, price controls uh, have been absolutely damaging, creating some pretty perverse incentives, and at minimum, uh, creating a situation where private producers are unwilling to produce at the level that they may, may produce at a higher price uh, under the price controls. So you have goods that are being trafficked outside of the formal market. Uh, you have goods that are actually leaving Venezuela and going to Colombia. And we have an economy that no longer has the dollars that it needs to import goods. All of this is, is working together to cause a great deal of havoc. I assume, as we all know, um, that this has not only led to this social and economic crisis uh, for the country, but it's also led to a real a refugee crisis. Uh, millions of Venezuelans ha have fled the country, no longer being able to survive, no longer being able to provide for their families, and, um, and that continues to the present day. Um, some are estimated we're looking at maybe over 6 million by the end of this year, uh, at least 4 million in the last five years. Um, so this, this, this movement of the population has been uh, an ongoing one, as people find, obviously, as, as any, uh, any society would, uh, find other ways of, of, of supporting their families, finding other ways of supporting themselves. Cause size has been a, a major, I think, another element of the crisis. This has been a long going problem, so even when Venezuela's economy was, was doing quite well, uh, it was moving up in the rankings of homicide rates. Presently, Venezuela, depending on the source, number one, number two, uh, number three uh, in the world in terms of homicide rate. Uh, countries in Central America uh, have typically, uh, I guess, been very worse on this particular uh, indicator. But nonetheless, this issue of, of public order uh, of crime uh, kind of compounding the, the economic and the social uh, challenges that Venezuelans are facing. And this, uh, this process has also involved um, periodic protests. Actually, from the very start of the Chavez years, or 1998, 1999, you've had this kind of public uh, conflict 
that has played itself out on Venezuelan streets. And including just a couple of weeks ago, and this is people are going to hopefully this will work. Uh, we'll see how this works. Just a couple of weeks ago, I want to share with you a quick clip of a protest that took place around March 10th uh, of this year. a little taste of, of the situation just a couple of weeks ago in Venezuela that uh, these protests continue to the, to the present day. Uh, so this pressure uh, from at least one certain segments of Venezuelan society demanding the end of the Maduro government. Yet, this government continues. Uh, Nicolas Maduro has been in power since 2013. Uh, he uh, won the presidential election that year, a month after Hugo Chavez uh, passed away from a, from a long battle with uh, cancer. And Maduro, despite the hyperinflation, despite the contraction of the economy, despite this refugee crisis, despite regular and periodic protests and clashes in the street, he continues to retain his hold uh, within the country uh, as president of Venezuela. And in fact, winning re-election in 2018 uh, in, a, in, a, in a contested uh, race uh, that particular year. This to me, it strikes me as an interesting question, an interesting puzzle. How is it that this government can continue to, to survive uh, year in, year out, day in and day out, despite these various uh, travails? Uh, when one thinks about Venezuela and one thinks about its, its system, uh, a common, uh, I guess, label that's been utilized among some comparative political scientists that try to look at Latin American politics or, or politics outside of the United States or beyond Latin America would be referred to as a comparative authoritarian regime. Um, and that basically is kind of a hybrid government, a, some type of government that has elements of a democratic system uh, that is coupled with a, with a non-democratic uh, uh, system, like right? so these traits that are mixed in with one system. So for example, in the case you just saw there a couple of weeks ago, we have opponents of the Maduro regime very openly, publicly protesting, given a degree of space to express their complaints. However, when it comes to election time, when it comes to when Maduro needs to face the voters, that's when the, the deck gets a bit stacked uh, and has been consistently, at least for the last two elections, in favor for the incumbent government. Uh, critics would argue this has happened even before that particular point in time, but nonetheless, increasingly, the government is finding ways to uh, keep itself in power in these elections. An opponent can challenge Maduro, but we're not gonna allow this candidate or that candidate because they might beat me. Or we're not going to, or we're going to make certain governmental money and that spending is going to help the incumbent uh, in terms of advertiser, in terms of public works project, and it's not going to go to any opponent of the regime. Um, we're going to really change election dates. We're going to try our best to change district lines. We're going to do whatever we can to ensure that the likelihood is great that I'm going to win again. And thus, I will continue that, that power and continue that authority. Uh, Freedom House more recently suggesting Venezuela is no longer even a hybrid. It has become much more a, a full authoritarian system. One in which the opposition, those who really want to get Maduro out of power, really have no genuine way of doing so. And thus issues of corruption, the power of the military, the police, and repressing opponents has become even greater than years past. And thus we're moving, shifting away from a hybrid to much more fully authoritarian system. Um, and, and thus, problems of torture, problems of extrajudicial execution, political prisoners, this, this level of repression, this level of authoritarianism becoming a bit more.
more intense, uh, a bit more extensive in its power. This is the puzzle and, and that, I, that I want us to kind of figure out. We have a situation in which we have authoritarian systems, yet we have one crisis after another, and we even have an active uh, opposition that is trying to pressure the government to get out of power. One, I guess, way of looking at this question is, is, to, is to examine comparativistic model of the trans, transition uh, literature. Uh, it's a pretty common, pretty long-standing um, approach to trying to look at transition, trying to understand why authoritarian systems break down, uh, understand why they transition from that model in which power is concentrated in the few, where you have some degree of decentralization, at some level of liberalization and then democratization, right? How do we move from a situation in which you're an authoritarian system here at this point and it breaks down? And that breakdown of non democratic regimes begins the process of establishing a new system of democracy and then hopefully consolidating it when no one questions that this is the model that you want to operate under and you want a democracy that's going to be strong and for the future. The transition literature will talk about different parts of that process. Um, historically, this idea that it often begins first with providing certain civil liberties, allowing some space for civil society, and then moving towards a situation where you actually have regular, fair, and free elections take place. I want to focus primarily on this issue of pact-making. Uh, this transition literature has often focused, focuses on the idea of this relationship between those who support the need for democracy and those who are within the state, within the government, who want to retain that authoritarian system. How do these two sides kind of come to an agreement uh, to actually move the society to a much more democratic direction? So let's kind of look a little bit at the kind of major uh, factors which will maybe help us understand why we have not seen that movement or that breakdown of that non-democratic regime and that movement or transition to a more of a democratic system. First and foremost, for me, I've got to start here. You've got to start with Hugo Chavez, uh, the man himself. Uh, Mr. Chavez, as I, I can hopefully we can recall, was a pretty kind of larger than life figure, a populist, someone who came to power in 1998 through a free and fair election and led a, a very nationalist, uh, socialist uh, view and approach to, to governing in Venezuela. He absolutely, he's the populist before Donald Trump comes about power, he's the populist of the moment. Uh, very much in terms of his attitude, his approach, that he's the one that's going to lead the country forward. He's the one that's going to lead the country against an elite, against those who've exploited the people in the past, against those who've taken advantage of the people in the past. And he was an effective uh, individual when it comes to rhetoric, when it comes to his charisma, and when it comes to his success as a politician. Even to this very day, with Nicolas Maduro, who was the, the anointed leader, Hugo Chavez selected him and said to, to the country, this is who you should support, this is the person who will be taking my mantle forward. Maduro is absolutely despised by most Venezuelans. 20%, uh, I've seen some polls, their favorability ratings are around 10, 15%. But Chavismo, this idea, this moment, this legacy is associated with Chavez that Maduro tries his best to defend, say that he represents, still retains a hold. You still have people who consider themselves to be Chavistas and still believe with all of his faults that Maduro, at minimum, is defending some elements of that, of that history, right? So this is a piece of it. There's still some support for this agenda. And why wouldn't there be, at least to some extent? When we think about Chavez and we think about Chavismo, we have to recognize, and by the way, think about the rise of the left in Latin America, Chavez is the one that really sets things off in the late 90s and early 2000s. And his government is associated with massive reductions in poverty, reductions in inequality, uh, expansion of uh, medical programs, literacy programs, higher education programs, you name it, uh, one after another. The, there was a massive oil boom during the period that Chavez was largely in power, especially uh, from the early 2000s, always the late 2000s, early 2010s, and that money was utilized uh, regularly to try to um, redistribute and create various programs that were focused on some of the more marginalized sectors of Venezuelan society. So in, in this sense, Chavez and Chavismo still retains a bit of a hold, right? 
of course, it's a very different world with Chavez when he was running things. When we're thinking about the amount of imports that were coming into the country uh, in 2008, 10 years ago, or the level of GDP growth, like six, seven, eight percent uh, during its peak, uh, compared to 2018, where we have a, re uh, a, a reduction in GDP, uh, poverty rates, uh, confidence in government, and of course the inflation rate. So, in all many respects, Maduro, I guess, in a sense, maybe in his defense, he's not governing during an oil boom. He's governing during an oil contraction. And that's definitely undermining his ability to maybe retain the level of support and authority that he once had. But nonetheless, there's still a degree of the secular Venezuelan society that is still willing to defend at minimum that legacy that maybe they view those who oppose Maduro as threatening. Um, by the way, Maduro still tries his best to use that social welfare state to the extent that he can. Uh, one mechanism in are these class boxes, uh, local committees for supply and production. The government on a monthly basis provides uh, at subsidized prices uh, to uh, millions of Venezuelans, usually extremely low income Venezuelans, uh, a supply of kind of basic food uh, that the government is absolutely not beyond using that as a political weapon to try to retain loyalty. Uh, and even reducing or restricting or not providing such, such boxes of food to those groups, to those individuals where they have evidence may not be supporting the Maduro government. But nonetheless, this notion of using this kind of the state as a way to purchase support is still a technique that the Maduro government is trying to exercise. They just don't have the money uh, like Chavez had uh, at his peak. Second factor, when one thinks about this issue, okay, so we got that piece, right? This idea that, okay, there's still some segment of Venezuelan society that, that, that has this, this support, this loyalty to you know, that movement that Maduro uh, still tries his best to represent. The other piece of it, who's facing the Maduro government? Well, we've got an opposition that is quite ideologically varied and quite fractious. Um, we have, for example, this image you have here. This is an image of Enrique Falcón. He is someone that ran for president in 2018. He's a part of the opposition, and he chose to run against the Maduro um, candidate, Maduro himself. And on the other side, we have individuals who are engaging in street protests. There's been a real divide in terms of tactics. Some members of the opposition very much believe that one can pursue an electoral strategy, that one can engage in negotiations and try to maybe begin that process of moving to more democratic systems. Others of the opposition say, forget about that. There's no way we're going to be able to do this peacefully. We have to engage in violent protests. We have to engage in disobedience. This is the only way that we can, we can actually achieve our objectives. By the way, we have about 20 different political parties that make up this opposition. So the idea of trying to unify them under one banner or one set of strategies has been a challenge and it has been a challenge now for, for some time. Um, we see this to this very, very day. We've got Juan Guaido, who is now recognized by approximately 60 countries around the world as the proper, correct, the actual president of Venezuela. He is a central leader of the opposition. He himself has shifted from engaging in negotiations with the Maduro government to absolutely calling on the military to overthrow the government uh, directly. Uh, and thus, the, the movement is still not being on the same page and consistently being able to work out the difference as to what are the proper tactics in order to achieve uh, the objective of removing Maduro from power. Can we negotiate with him and somehow break some concessions for him? Or do we need to create more and more pressure, more sanctions, more protests, and even maybe engaging in violence with the help of the military to remove him from power? So that's a challenge, and that's a puzzle, and that's to the benefit of Maduro that the opposition cannot get their act together in some unified way. One can't, in any democratization, let me just put that out there, I think it, it, it absolutely um, would be incorrect or perhaps a mistake for one to kind of look at any situation around the world where countries have transitioned from a non-democratic model to a more democratic model and not pay attention to what external factors have facilitated or undermined or made it more difficult to happen. So in the case of Venezuela, we definitely need to think about this troika of Russia, China, and Cuba. Uh, they have very much been the lifeline to the Maduro government in terms of providing loans, uh, providing investment to the Venezuelan oil industry, purchasing of uh, Venezuelan oil. China has provided billions in loans 
in exchange for oil. Uh, Russia has provided uh, military contracts, military weaponry, as well as investments. And Cuba, uh, a whole array of advisors for the military, uh, for the country's politics. Uh, Cubans, we have engaged in actually spying on the Venezuelan military in order to seek out those in the military who may be disloyal, who may be willing to challenge the government in one form or another. So these actors are, are very much relevant when one thinks about Maduro, right? So he's not absolutely isolated. He still can retain the support so far on some pretty powerful actors economically and ideologically when one thinks about uh, the country of Cuba. External actors, we cannot forget perhaps one of the more important external actors, and that would be, um, of course, the United States when we talk about Latin America. Uh, let's get a quick clip here of President Trump uh, speaking to a crowd in Miami uh, last year. Our standing for freedom and democracy and the United States of America is standing right by their side. Well, President of the United States, I end by you a short time ago reaffirming the U.S. commitment to freedom in Venezuela. Describing Venezuela's total collapse, President Trump said socialism in this hemisphere is in its twilight. The president also called on members of Venezuela's military to stand aside Saturday when there will be an attempt to deliver humanitarian aid. We have extensive coverage of today's developments, beginning with CBS Ford Hank Tester, who has more on the president's speech. Hank? Now, Ellie, I can tell you this. It was a speech that was designed specifically to these folks, and they ate it up. He hit all the right buttons for the Venezuelans, the Cubans, and the Nicaraguans who were in the crowd. And he, uh, we have to remember here that this crowd here that he uh, spoke to today plays a very, very important role in the state of Florida when election time comes around with Donald Trump once again. Let's take a look. President Donald Trump incites right in on a very friendly crowd of traditional supporters mixed with a large turnout of Venezuelans here to hear the president's message of support. It did not take the president long to toss this crowd the red meat they were looking for. A new day is coming in Latin America. It's coming. In Venezuela. And across the Western Hemisphere, socialism is dying, and liberty, prosperity, and democracy are being reborn. And Trump on delivery of humanitarian aid to the Venezuelan people, huge piles of food and supplies staged, ready to be moved into the ravaged country, but blocked by Nicolas Maduro, who Trump describes as... For a man controlled by the Cuban military and protected by a private army of Cuban soldiers. Maduro is not a Venezuelan patriot. He is a Cuban puppet. That's what he is. Calling out Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and the failed socialist economy, Trump helped to score points with local Venezuelans, Cubans, Nicaraguans, and his base with harsh words for those who espouse socialism. For decades, the socialist dictatorships of Cuba and Venezuela have propped each other up in a very corrupt bargain. Venezuela gave Cuba oil. In return, Cuba gave Venezuela a police state run directly from Havana. Well, the crowd was fired up, and we can tell you the big question is, however, what goes down on February 23rd? That's the day that the President uh, Wado has promised all that U.S. support humanitarian aid will get into Venezuela. That's a potential flashpoint. I'm Hank Chester, CBS 4 News. Okay. Um, so as that, that clip talks about, and as we all should know, that those that humanitarian aid ends up not getting uh, into uh, Venezuela. But that those those actors there, and by the way, this is my alma mater. I graduated from FIU. I grew up in Miami, so it's good to see my, my, my college being uh, represented there. Um, that, uh, that situation in terms of this, this exile community in, in Florida is one in which has been a, a major factor. When you think about that opposition, and not only is ideologically kind of varied, but that opposition in Venezuela, we have a community there in Florida 
that has been a major financier of a lot of the opposition activities in the country. And the Floridian Venezuelans are very much representing a much more hard line viewpoint, uh, ones that want to see the United States play a more aggressive role uh, in the country. When one thinks about this issue of the United States, definitely it is a major factor, uh, especially in terms of this situation of, um, in particular, obviously the, the challenges facing the Maduro government to, to survive or not. Uh, the extent that the United States has been increasing its sanctions uh, upon the country and in order to hopefully, the objective ostensibly stated by the United States, to create a, a, a situation in which the people themselves become so frustrated, so unhappy with the government that they eventually more, I guess, more willingly uh, want to support its overthrow. Or at minimum, right, alienate some sectors of Maduro's uh, coalition, alienate sectors of the military in the hopes that they will either step aside in front of an uprising or join one uh, in the hopes of o overthrowing the government. I can't help but not think, when we're thinking about U.S. trade embargoes on uh, socialist-type governments, has been the failed Cuban embargo that's been going on now for almost 60 years. And in a sense, this kind of repeat of this hope or this expectation that if we squeeze them enough economically, that they eventually will shift. It's quite likely, though, if Cuba is any guide, it may strengthen uh, the authoritarian actors within Venezuela, right, who can now rely upon a more nationalist uh, viewpoint and against the United States or at minimum can at least blame the economic crises and problems on the United States and not on the, uh, the errors and corruption of the Maduro government. So in that sense, this, this issue of the U U.S. Is, is, is fundamental, not only in supporting Venezuelan exiles who are a part of that opposition, but also in creating these obstacles for the Maduro government in terms of trying to improve it, its particular uh, situation. Uh, so you know, in terms of the oil uh, sanctions that have been, uh, been imposed in the last few years, uh, basically uh, undermining about 90% of the government's revenue from the oil industry. Uh, the United States has made it more difficult for Venezuela to actually access international finance markets and credit markets in order to refinance their debts. So the U.S. has very much been going hard, especially during the Trump administration, to, to undermine and, and weaken the, the economy. Um, all right, so we got a little sense of some of the background, some of the kind of central actors, external actors, that opposition, a bit about the Maduro government, but I will go a little bit more into the Maduro government in a, in a moment. But I thought, I, if we think about transitions, anytime I talk about this issue of my classes, I show them uh, Robert Dahl's uh, diagram towards the transition zone. And for Dahl, he had, uh, he's kind of a famous, famous political scientist back in the day, and he made an argument, he asserted when thinking about authoritarian uh, coalitions, when thinking about authoritarian actors, uh, he looked at them as engaging this kind of rational calculus. Uh, how much can they tolerate the opposition, tolerate those actors that want them to be out of power or want democracy? How much does it cost them to tolerate or not? Uh, or how much does it cost them to repress those actors? to actually punish them, imprison them, uh, exile them, et cetera. For Dahl, that cost-benefit analysis is an important one, because as those costs of tolerating the opposition decline, um, and perhaps the simultaneously the cost of repression increase, we should see openings within that coalition, openings to democratization, to that change in how government operates within that country. Um, to what extent can we shift uh, the authoritarian coalition's uh, calculus to make them say, you know what, we're willing to step aside. We're willing to step down from power. Um, let's explore this, this for a bit. What would move that, that coalition to say, I am willing, I'm willing to allow democracy to emerge within this country? I, I've got to show you Chile. I know, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I apologize by going to another South American country. But I thought it was important because when I think about uh, Dahl's kind of concept of a uh, kind of rational calculus, and when I think about pacts and transitions, I can't help but think about Chile. Here we have an image. Here's Augusto Pinochet in his, all his glory, uh, as the commander of the uh, Chilean military. In uh, 1973, he leads a military coup, establishing a, a relatively brutal, repressive government that ruled Chile from 1973 to 1988. Here's uh, Mr. Pinochet in 1998, 
uh, really nice looking suit uh, as a member of the Chilean legislature. Uh, Chile transitioned uh, from an authoritarian system, the military government, uh, in the late 80s and early 1990s. But there was a cost or a price to be paid. They allowed and they basically granted as a part of the transition, as a part of that bargain, Pinochet and his allies with the military impunity, not just impunity for the crimes that they committed, at least for a period of time. Now, I'm not going to digress in terms of things that happened later, but impunity for the crimes they committed, but they also allowed them power. They allowed them authority within the Chilean military, and they allowed them continued authority within the Chilean legislature. This is an individual that led a military regime that led to the deaths of 3,000 approximately Chileans, torture of thousands of others, exiled of thousands of others, a brutal system. And yet in order to remove him from power, the opposition, the opposition to that military regime had to give something up. And that's what we're talking about in terms of reducing the cost of tolerating uh, that opposition. Uh, Pinochet could continue to have an influence within the government, even though it was under a democratic system, uh, not under his military rule. Transitions from authoritarian rule, they are definitely uncertain, right? It's not, it's not predictable. But what we, we can look at when we look at transitions around the world, that oftentimes, especially successful ones, uh, ones that lead to stable democracies, there usually is a give or take from both sides. There usually is this effort to try to find a way to move that authoritarian actor uh, from out of power uh, in order to uh, facilitate uh, democratic actors to, to come to power, uh, making it easier some way for that government to step down. Now, let me note, not all transitions operate exactly in this way, but in terms of some successful ones, and I think the Chilean one is, is a great example of that, that negotiation, that pact making can be quite important. Well, let's think about pack making and think about some of the benefits. What would, what is the rational calculus for Maduro and his ruling coalition? What could the opposition or even the United States offer? Um, one thing we keep in mind, there is some money to be made uh, to be a part of Maduro ruling coalition. Uh, and in fact, there has been a real issue of corruption and, and money that has just been absolutely outlandish in terms of the pillaging that's been taking place within the country. So an investigation by the Congressional Committee putting the number at $70 billion in which, there, in which state budget, state spending has been siphoned away. Some put it at close to $300 billion. There are actors that are benefiting from the Maduro government coming to power um, that is not unsubstantial. Some analysts and one I would definitely recommend, there's a whole group of journalists that called Insight Crime. So a website that looks at crime and drug trafficking and organized crime within Latin America, highly recommend it for anyone who wants to have an introductory kind of view uh, on these issues. Uh, they refer to Venezuela as a mafia state. The United States government, the DEA, uh, also is in agreement with that uh, conception or construction of Venezuela. Uh, ranks 166 out of 176 countries, uh, according to Transparency, Transparency International. Uh, that's not a good position to be in. The higher the number, the more corrupt one happens to be. Over 100 officials linked in some way with organized crime, largely with organized crimes affiliated with drug trade. Um, U.S. officials estimated over 200 metric tons of cocaine passed through Venezuela off to various, trend, uh, various uh, markets, the United States being a central one, Europe, Brazil. Uh, and so we have a, a situation in which drug trafficking has been a fruitful, fruitful kind of supply of resources and profit uh, within the Venezuelan military as well as within the Venezuelan government, right? So we have a situation in which the government is not really enforcing uh, some of these laws and thus these actors are able to benefit from that situation. An exchange system, those importers, many of them are allied with the government. Some are, are doing some degree of importing, some are importing goods. They get those cheap dollars so they can actually import goods. Uh, some are importing goods and they're just crossing on over to Colombia selling them at a great profit, and some are just simply constructing invoices and not really importing a thing, just pocketing whatever money they get when they give their bolivares, their, their Venezuelan currency to the government to get U.S. dollars so they can import goods, right? So those allies are also benefiting from this, uh, this machine, right, this kind of corrupt operation. Um, <clears throat> think about that coalition. So we've got actors within the Venezuelan state that benefit from the continuation of this non-democratic system. 
And so we need to find a way to deal with those individuals if you want to remove them from supporting the Maduro government. But more importantly, fundamentally, any non-democratic system, we need to ask the question, where does the military stand? Uh, this is a quote from Zoltan Barani, How Armies Respond to Revolutions, a great book that I highly recommend to anyone who wants to get an idea of why transitions happen or don't happen. Where does the military stand in this conflict? No institution matters more to a state's survival than its military, and no major uprising within a state can succeed without the support of the armed forces. Wang Guaido, that uh, Sherrod, she just made a reference to it, Wang Guaido uh, found that out in April of last year. Now let's take a look at Wang Guaido for a moment as his, his attempt to try to get the military to back him. Bueno, Venezuela, muy buenos días. Como ustedes saben, nuestra lucha ha estado siempre enmarcada en la Constitución. April 30th, 2019. En la lucha no violenta, en trabajar por el prójimo, en salvar vidas, en trabajar por los más vulnerables, en atender a nuestras familias, en construir capacidades en el marco siempre de nuestra Constitución. En ese proceso, dijimos, cuando el pueblo está en las calles, asumiríamos las competencias. Cuando la comunidad internacional respaldara ampliamente nuestra lucha, estaríamos con el pueblo de Venezuela. En este momento, hacemos un gran llamado a los empleados públicos y a un componente fundamental, no solamente para la transición, sino para la reconstrucción de Venezuela, recuperar soberanía nacional. Nuestras fuerzas armadas, hoy, valientes soldados, valientes patriotas, valientes hombres apegados a la Constitución, han acudido a nuestro llamado. Hemos acudido también al llamado. Nos hemos encontrado definitivamente en las calles de Venezuela. La Operación Libertad, los comités de ayuda y libertad, nos invito inmediatamente a activarse. Nos invito inmediatamente a cubrir las calles de Venezuela. El primero de mayo empezó hoy. El cese definitivo de la usurpación empezó hoy. Contamos con el pueblo de Venezuela hoy Las Fuerzas Armadas claramente están del lado del pueblo, están del lado de la Constitución, leales a la Constitución, leales al pueblo de Venezuela, a su familia, al futuro, al progreso. Ha sido años de sacrificio. Hoy, como presidente encargado de Venezuela, legítimo comandante en jefe de las Fuerzas Armadas, convoco a todos los soldados, a todos y a todas, la familia militar, a acompañarnos en esta gesta, como siempre hemos hecho, En el marco de la Constitución, en el marco de la lucha no violenta que hemos hecho en todo momento, todos los que están escuchándonos, a todos los que nos van a escuchar en los próximos minutos, es el momento. El momento es ahora. El momento no solamente de la calma y la cordura, en este momento del coraje y la cordura para que llegue la calma a Venezuela. Dios los bendiga, seguimos adelante, vamos a lograr la libertad y la democracia de Venezuela. All right, so that event happened in 48 hours, that entire attempt to bring the military on side of Guaido and the opposition absolutely collapsed. Uh, approximately a thousand soldiers defected, uh, they fled to Colombia, and, uh, but in the main, the armed forces did not move. The high command stuck behind Maduro, as well as mid-level uh, officers and their rank and file. Uh, it was a failure. And there was no uh, support uh, for Guaido's call of the Venezuelan military on the night of April 30th, the beginning of May 1st, to join his movement and to remove Maduro from power. And one I should not be surprised by this, right? So we have a situation that um, this military is one that has a great deal of authority, a great deal of benefits, and a great deal of privileges associated with the Maduro government. And the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. What will a future government, how will a future government treat the military? Will it treat them in the same way that the Maduro government and prior to him, the Chavez government, has treated the military? So the country's 150,000 Army, Navy, uh, Air Force, National Guard troops um, have about 150,000, but with as many as 2,000 admirals and generals, now boasts as much as twice the top brass as the U.S. military. More than 10 times as many flag officers as this when Chavez became president. So we have a situation where, right, obviously, those promotions, those officers, those are greater salaries, greater benefits, 
that's a nice benefit to kind of stick with the, the devil that you know. The principal beneficiary of Venezuela's exchange system is the military. They control, so the military, keep in mind, the armed forces of Venezuela, and this has been uh, a reality for some time, they're not just simply involved in national security. They're involved in food distribution. They're involved in medicine. Uh, they actually own a, their own TV station. Um, they play a role in running the oil industry. They play a role in running the gas, natural gas industry. They have these economic, uh, I guess, tentacles that go well beyond uh, just this kind of national security uh, military function that we would associate with uh, consolidated democracies around the world. Um, Maduro absolutely is fully aware of Barani's quote. He knows that if the military does not back him, he's probably not going to last. So we have 32 cabinet posts that are currently held, um, or they're held by half of those 32 cabinet posts held by the military or former members of the military. So they either are in uniform right now holding those positions or they were recently retired. So the military is gaining a great deal. They have access to the stream of profit and money uh, from their positions within the economy and the kind of state, uh, very state industries and state companies. Uh, they have a great deal of wealth that's coming to them from being promoted and being ranked in these kind of ranking positions with greater benefits, uh, greater influence, and they actually have a political voice. To what extent is all this going to be the same if they, they give a switch size to the opposition? To what extent are they going to retain that? Hey, and by the way, the military is also a, uh, been tied to drug, drug trade and drug trafficking, as well as to human rights violations. Are they going to have impunity for those? Will they be actually brought to court? Will they be arrested in a democratic transition? What really will they be facing? What future will they be facing under the opposition? As of right now, the military has decided we're going to stick with this authoritarian coalition uh, because of right now, as of this moment, and it has been now since 2013, Maduro has been in power now, so almost seven years, um, we're going to continue to back this particular system. <clears throat> so I guess I want to kind of do some concluding thoughts. And I know we're going to kind of have a break here and hopefully get some questions. When we're thinking about this puzzle that we started off with, we have this incredible crisis uh, this incredible economic, social crisis, and the political crisis, and yet the government continues on day in and day out, month in and month out, year in and year out. What's clear, at least at this time, economic sanctions of this level and the, the kind of implosion of the economy have not been sufficient to, to kind of shift that rational calculus of the ruling coalition, have not been sufficient to actually lead to a transition uh, within a country. We've got continued divisions within that opposition that have kind of undermined and weakened them. And Maduro has been very effective at working the different factions against each other, offering concessions here to some sectors, offering concessions to some other sector in the hopes that they remain divided. Uh, peaceful and electoral challenges coupled with negotiations seem to be at this point probably the best chance, if there can be a unified effort by the opposition, to resolve uh, this crisis. Um, I think there's no doubt that if it's going to happen, external actors have to be pretty have to be part of that equation, and in particular the United States. The United States right now is seeking a position of kind of harder and harder sanctions while backing some of the more extreme sectors of the opposition. To what extent that so far has not worked uh, as a method and has so far failed the Trump administration in terms of the effort of removing Maduro from power. Uh, the idea of them moving to legitimizing that peace process would probably go far in convincing Maduro that the opposition is serious if the United States is backing that particular strategy. Uh, the commitment of the U.S. and the opposition to a negotiated transition that offers genuine guarantees, which as of right now, there is nothing in no opposition leader has called for those kinds of guarantees in which Maduro would still have some political power, let's say, for example, like Pinochet in Chile. Um, but at the moment, this seems like this may be the option that would start Venezuela's democratic transition. What extent can they shift that calculus, shift that calculation for that coalition in order to begin that process of a transition to democracy? So I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, I apologize for some of the tech uh, issues. Hopefully, um, I was loud enough. I hope I sorry if I, I spoke too loud, but uh, and I apologize for my my speaker. So um, thank you for your attention. Uh, 
I think the sound came out okay after about halfway through, then I could hear it. Okay, good. He's getting it out there. How do we submit questions? You want us to take a break before we uh, do questions? Yes, I think five minutes break on the picture. No. No? Okay. Why are we getting an answer? There's something about many of us having turned on our microphones that is causing this to malfunction again. Um, Can you hear me now? Um, let's take a five minute break and then there is a chat window that you can open. Um, to post questions. I will try and unmute people. If you are using a headset, then there will not be a problem with feedback. If you're using just your regular computer audio, then there may be some feedback that hinders the conversation. I'm going to open up the channel now um, for everyone to talk. Brandon, the consensus seems to be that uh, we should not have a break and just uh, have the Q&A started right away. I, I think that's good. If, if you hear feedback and you think it's coming from your computer, um, please uh, mute your audio in the bottom left of your screen. You can start your video. Um, uh, he indicated that it would be nice to see people's faces so he can see what we're interested in, in talking about. Thanks for everybody's patience. Um, my background uh, initially in the workforce was in as a sysadmin for uh, networks and for desktops. And, and I think either at the beginning of the session there was a lack of bandwidth in Kearney um, or there were some other things going on that prevented good audio, but at the end of this session, and it, it was, it, it sounded strong. So I will uh, mute and um, post questions to chat or speak out. I have a question, uh, would just be, I'm Susan Johnston, I don't have video. I'd like to mo know more about what uh, Guaido is doing these days, and what are some other names of the opposition? Uh, well, Guaido is, is um, he's been engaged in a recent uh, protest, he's still protest, the protest, you saw him in the protest of March 10th. Um, he has, uh, was engaged in some, some additional street protests that, um, though, were relatively significant, weren't as big as, as years past. Obviously, we all saw him in the State of the Union address. Uh, countries around the world in the, in the hopes of uh, bolstering uh, their support for, for his effort for, for a transition to democracy. One of uh, uh, other kind of leaders I would talk about, there was an individual that I showed you, by the way, that, that video in the end where you saw Guaido calling on the military, that was a highway overpass that um, right next to a, a, a mil major military base in Caracas. There was a gentleman near him, Leopoldo Lopez, who is another central figure within the uh, opposition. Lopez actually was under house arrest, and this military team actually freed him. So they did have some success. They freed uh, a central leader of the opposition. He's a prominent actor uh, within the opposition, and he, uh, in contrast to Guaido, has been much more associated with the more uh, militant uh, factions within that, that group who have 
called for violent kind of protests and disobedience in the hopes of removing Maduro from power. Uh, I would also include Falcón. So he's the individual that ran for president in 2018. He used to be a part of Chavez as a kind of inner circle. Uh, he left the government in 2010 to join the opposition. And he definitely represents a, a, a faction that really feels that a negotiation can be won and, and negotiations can be had with Maduro and with his, uh, his allies. Uh, so Guaido is, is kind of curious. He at times has been more militant um, and other times he's been much more seemingly open to political solutions. Oh, and Capriles, another figure. Um, he is someone who has run for president a couple of times he nearly won in 2013. He came very close to winning the election, representing the opposition. He still is active. And again, he has shifted. The, the, the factions kind of shift depending on where they feel the population is moving. Uh, if they feel they want to back more militant, more aggressive tactics or another, and you have these leaders don't want to get uh, left out. Uh, so those are some kind of leading figures, Capriles, uh, Lopez, uh, Falcón, and uh, Guaido. Um, can you can you hear me okay? I can hear you great, Richard. All right. Um, it uh, it seems important to understand the underlying needs and motivations of people who are dictators before they get moved out in order to know what you can potentially used as an inducement. Uh, it's interesting what you said about Pinochet, um, obviously wanting to retain power and not being interested in things like a, uh, a cushioned retirement with lots of money and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And I think about maybe Doc in, uh, in Haiti a number of years ago. He seemed to be willing to go, given that he could receive that kind of protection um, in another country and a, and a financial cushion and so on and so forth. Do we know enough about Maduro to, to know if there are some handles that we have been, we at the governmental level mm. have been missing? And do you think that there's a possibility that, like some other governments around the world, that uh, these folks are thinking maybe they might be able to negotiate something after the next U.S. elections. Well, that, that's a good point. And I think that's an interesting, and I, think, I often think about even the external actors like Russia and China in terms of their kind of geopolitics, to what extent do they want to continue to back Maduro until that next election in, in, the, in order to see how there would be a shift maybe back to pulling back on some of the, the sanctions. Because there's no doubt the Trump administration from Obama has absolutely escalated uh, the kind of economic pressure upon the country. So I think that's a very good point. As far as Maduro, it's hard to say. I, I would, from his kind of politics and his uh, actions, and given the fact that it's clear that the level of corruption that has happened within the country has become so prominent, and he's seeming so dependent upon it, you, you almost get a sense from Maduro that he is not necessarily driven by maybe an ideological uh, goals anymore. Uh, perhaps at one time that would be the case. And you think about someone like Pinochet, he very much ideologically was driven. He still wanted a voice in that government to ensure it didn't go too far to the left. Uh, with Maduro, given the various crimes that he and his allies have been implicated in, that notion of impunity, that notion of being able to retain some of his wealth may go far uh, in terms of creating that incentive. But the opposition, I mean, I'll give you an example, Richard. In 2015, the opposition actually was able to win a majority of the, the National Assembly. They actually got the legislature. They were able to get a majority. And they spent from day one was to get Maduro out of power and to put him to justice. They were going to remove him without a single benefit to him whatsoever. And they did all their efforts towards that. So just simply polarizing things once again. Um, so there was no interest whatsoever to concede impunity or economic benefits, just get him out of power and take him to justice. Uh, so there needs to be some bit more movement I, in, in my, from my vantage point from the opposition. And I don't think it would be ideological. I don't get a sense that Maduro 
would necessarily need to have the government moving more in a left direction in order to get out of power. But so far, that hasn't been tested. It really fully hasn't been tested yet to see if that would be sufficient. I think our current government has the capacity, the, the knowledge, the wherewithal to, um, to test that in some way. I mean, Pompeo and, and now that the State Department's been essentially gutted and, and um, bypassed in so many ways, um, have we lost the ability to even think in these terms? I, I can't help but think of parallels with uh, our U.S.-Cuban policy. And I'm convinced that the Trump administration, uh, putting aside your excellent point regarding how we've gutted the State Department, but that the Trump administration is being guided by, by the domestic politics of the state of Florida. And, and a belief that, uh, that a hard line uh, on the Venezuelan government, like a hard line on the Cuban government, putting aside that Cuban Americans have shifted on that position, but in some of those elites, those that have resources, those that are the loudest voices within the mass media in Florida, and the Latin mass media in Florida, to them, I believe they're absolutely convinced that they don't benefit in 2020, in this election coming up, by softening or trying to work with the Maduro government, but they benefit politically from me maintaining that control and tightening things in the hopes of, of, of winning the state of Florida. And to be honest, the politics of U.S. Cuba policy has been so kind of interacting with that presidential politics and campaigns that it's been difficult to move that, as we see, uh, to move that relationship in a way that one would think would be more diplomatic, more political as opposed to those economic sanctions, uh, which lasted not very long after Obama moved in the direction of giving diplomatic recognition. It seems to me that the Trump administration is being guided more by, by those dynamics, more so than, than their success. I mean, I think there's some reports that they were caught off guard by the failure of the April 2019 effort to rouse the military, that they underestimated the degree that the military for uh, ideological or for economic or criminal reasons was wedded to the Maduro government. And so that, that may be a part of them just misunderstanding and not having enough intelligence, enough kind of information about what was going on on the ground. So th there's that consistent with your point, but I would not, I do not expect any change in Trump administration's behavior, even if it can be made a convincing case that Maduro will get out of power. Not, not here we are in a uh, March, just months away from the November election. So I believe they, they have put their, their bet on a, on a hard, maybe even more tightening sanctions as a way to kind of bolster their support within the state. Let me, let me interrupt for a moment. Um, uh, Richard, I don't know if you have the Zoom group chat window open. Zoom group chat window. Yeah, um, and if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a thing that looks like a, a kind of a, a cloud that says chat. Yep. Um, and, and in there, um, what I've asked people to do is submit their questions. And you may need to scroll back up to ask some of those questions. But as we started to do this, and I apologize because I'm just learning as we go, it occurred to me that it would be good to maybe have you submit the questions or uh, uh, Will can look at those as well. Okay. Um, and respond to them. Can sure. you both see the uh, group chat? Because I think some people have yep. posted some yep. questions there. All right, I'm going to mute myself and, and let you guys talk. Okay, so I guess, should, should I just go ahead and just start responding to some of these questions that are here, uh, Brendan? Yeah, I uh, work from the top down. Okay, um, let's see here. So. So Guaido, so I think Priscilla asked me, who is Guaido? Why does the U.S. like him? You said the U.S. liked the most extreme. So Guaido is a, is a congressman uh, in Venezuela. He was a, selected by the, the, uh, the Congress, the Assembly, to lead that, that uh, legislature uh, because the opposition actually uh, controls a majority of it. And, and from that position, the Congress actually elected him as president of Venezuela. They refer to him as the interim president because they argue that Maduro has lost his legitimacy as president. So in the case of Venezuela, we have these two uh, battling executives. Uh, Guaido, who has been given his power from the National Assembly, 
And for Maduro, he got elected in 2018, re-elected in 2018, and his power comes from that, that vote. The United States recognizes Guaido as the president of Venezuela. So, and they like him because he supports the removal of a, a government that they view as a socialist dictatorship. Uh, he supports increasing ties with the United States, uh, increasing uh, connections with uh, the global economy. And so he shares a lot of the beliefs and, and politics that are in line with, with U.S. interests in the region. Uh, so uh, for those reasons, he, is this, he has this, this status, this power. Um, but unfortunately for Guaido, this power mainly exists outside of Venezuela. Within Venezuela, as long as the military continues to back uh, Maduro, as long as the national police continue to back Maduro, Maduro has the authority within the territory. But Guaido, uh, outside of it, has increasingly getting support uh, from around the world. How do, Richard and Christy, how do you define democracy, broadly speaking? How do you compare democracy in the U.S. and democracy in Venezuela? Well, I mean, democracy, I mean, obviously, that's a really contested subject and contested concept. Um, the kind of classic uh, conception of democracy is the idea of, of liberal democracy or indirect democracy. Does contestation exist? Do you, can you actually have more than one party, multiple parties, being able to legitimately compete uh, in order to obtain a power or authority? Do the people have the ability to hold people to account? So I think a contestation, accountability, um, participation. So do you have the authority to actually remove people from power? Uh, and select some other actor in order to maybe punish them for not doing what the people want them to do? And finally, can the public actually participate? Uh, are all major groups in society allowed within that political process? That, to me, would be a minimal level of, of, a, of a country meeting, that criteria of democracy, uh, and that is, is, is one that we're going to use. Formal democracy or liberal democracy, putting aside participatory democracy, direct democracy, which to me are much, uh, I guess, more stronger, more extensive ways of participating. So can people participate? Is there a real competition? Does your vote actually hold people to account? So in the case of Venezuela, competition has been undermined. So the incumbent government, each particular election, has found different ways to benefit themselves in that race. So for example, in 2018, before those elections took place, the Maduro administration, uh, with the courts, and the courts are absolutely dominated by the, um, the PSUV, the Socialist Party of Venezuela, which is Maduro's party, um, they decided, they alleged, that the top, most popular candidates of the opposition could not run, uh, that they had violated the law, that they were engaging in corruptness. They, they constructed, more or less constructed these charges that most observers don't give much credence to and said they are not allowed to compete. You can select some others, but not the most popular figures within the, the opposition. So in that sense, the incumbent government was determining who they were going to race against. And it, does, it helped that incumbent government, Maduro, uh, uh, win that, that particular campaign. Um, the government has, during the Chavez years, as well as during the Maduro years, spent a lot of money, especially near election time, to try to bolster uh, the campaign. So the, the incumbent gets a lot of basically campaign spending from governmental resources, governmental expenditures that are timed consistently every single election to time with the Maduro government. Uh, so in that sense, contestation is also imbalanced and is, is, is undermined. Um, how do I compare it to the United States and democracy in Venezuela? Well, I and mean, that's a really good question. I think it's, it's one that's when you think about, at least in the case of Venezuela, whoever wins the most votes, the popular vote is the one that wins, <laughs> which obviously, as we know, that's not our system in the United States. Uh, since Trump and George W. Bush in 2000 both won elections without getting the popular vote. Uh, but I think in the sense of the United States, we can, we can at least all agree that we have genuine contestation. And we can all agree that that when a particular party that's not the incumbent party gets a hold of a particular branch, they have genuine authority, they have genuine a power. Even the National Assembly, uh, when the opposition got that power, the Venezuelan court argued, Supreme Court argued they lost, they had violated various norms of the Constitution and did not have legitimacy to pass laws. So the government, using the courts, basically make the claim that the legislative branch didn't have genuine authority or power. And thus, 
we can ignore it uh, altogether. Um, don't expect Donald Trump making that effort to do so. I don't expect anytime soon that the, the president would actually use his authority to argue that the House of Representatives no longer is legitimate, is an institution that should be ignored. And in fact, all these other bodies that I have control are going to basically put it to the side and not pay attention to it. Um, so that sense, I think contestation is genuine, more genuine here in the United States. Uh, I think all actors uh, participate uh, and can participate and are not excluded in terms of voting. Um, I can go on another example. There have been instances in which uh, the Venezuelan government has denied certain resources to individuals, to groups of people who they conclude are part of the opposition. Those CLAP packages I was telling you about, uh, plenty of human rights actors have suggested that they have been used as a way to actually bolster Maduro's support. And that people who ended up voting for the opposition somehow getting off the list to receive that benefit. Uh, or all of a sudden not getting that job within the public sector or not getting certain benefits from the public sector because they signed a petition against the incumbent government. As of right now, I have not, I don't know many instances of that happening in the United States. Uh, but those kinds of things have happened um, at different times during the Chavez years, as well as the, during the Maduro years. Um, why does, I think I asked a question about why US likes Guaido. Um, I probably do have compromised bandwidth. I apologize for that, Brendan. Let's see. <laughs> uh, let's see. So we stay hardline, get lots of Venezuelan immigrants. That would be more GOP voters. I guess to an extent, Priscilla, I think that's a good statement. Uh, but of course, uh, the Trump administration hasn't necessarily been opening these refugees with open arms. So you have a bit of a, a conflict there, right? So America first, build the wall. Let's not allow refugees to come into this country, Venezuelan or not. Um, but we are going to retain a hard line because the Venezuelans that are in Florida and they can vote, at least their leaders, seem to like that hard line. So we're going to keep going with that hard line no matter what the consequences. Uh, you know, with the consequences for the immigrants, they're going to Colombia. Colombia has had o over a million Venezuelan immigrants uh, enter this country over these last five or six years. They are the ones that I guess are suffering or at least are having to adapt um, to this influx of, of people who are, are trying to find work, need benefit, need housing, need all the things that one would need to provide a, a refugee size of this scale. Um, do you see a potential role for other governments, this is from C. Francis, for other governments to have more success in negotiating with Maduro, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil? Yeah, I, I think that Colombia is, is an interesting actor in this case. Uh, Colombia and Venezuela have often butted heads uh, over their border, over economic policies, uh, over a whole range of issues. Um, and they, I think, of all of these, those countries you list, it's, would probably be the most important. Uh, not only because of this, this immigrant population they now have, but because uh, Venezuela has, this gets a little bit complicated, but Venezuela has long been a place where Colombian insurgents, so Colombia has been in the Civil War for many, many decades, um, and you've had armed actors fighting the Colombian government, a lot of them kind of camp out in Venezuela and then leave Venezuela to fight into Colombia, fighting against the Colombian government. That's an issue. Uh, that there's an incentive for Colombia to maybe want to work things out with Maduro or maybe help to facilitate that change. However, as of right now, the government in, in Colombia is very uh, conservative and it actually has recognized Guaido and has cut off its relationship with the Maduro government. So it is, is not interested at this moment to try to facilitate any kind of diplomatic or negotiated transition. Uh, countries like Mexico and Uruguay have been probably the most prominent in terms of trying to find a way to, to moderate between the two sides. The Vatican has also played a role at different points over the last few years. I suspect going forward, those are the actors that are probably going to be most influential. Right now, Colombia, Brazil, they're governed by very conservative governments who have very little love for the Maduro government and so um, have been much more sympathetic to the opposition. And so as of right now, I don't see that in the cars in the immediate future. Has the Trump administration support hurt Guaido instead of helping him? How do these people in Latin America view the Trump administration? So the Trump administration support Guaido, I think to some extent, I mean, especially when you're thinking about it makes it easier when you have Guaido being a uh, standing ovation by Democrats and Republicans in the State of the Union address, he can very easily point to that 
and say, look, the leader of the opposition, he's simply a tool of the United States. The leader of the opposition does not have your interests in mind, Venezuelans. He has the interests of Americans mind or the Trump administration in mind. And thus, whether that be true or not, and I would submit that it's not true, I think Guaido very genuinely wants to see this transition and very genuinely believes the Maduro government is, is, a, is a negative force within the country. But it, that relationship is, is a kind of, a, it cuts both ways for Guaido. He needs the legitimacy that comes with the United States support. He, need, he and his allies need the financing that comes from the United States support. And of course, the U.S. is providing the sanctions that are creating that lever against Maduro. But at the same time, it makes him having to deal with, having to explain to what extent he's not a tool of the United States. Him having to try to defend himself as not being this, this weapon to uh, promote the Trump administration's goals, but that he really does have the Venezuelan's heart and mind. So it, 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 it's complex, but it doesn't play, it places him in a, in a difficult position, uh, I would submit. I think those are the questions. That was from Sharad, so. You're muted, Brendan. Yeah, I think you did answer my second part of my question. Oh, how do people in Latin America view the Trump administration? Oh, well, those those numbers have declined. Uh, in terms of approval rates, I can't off the top of my head. For what they were during the Obama years, though, those numbers have, have significantly declined, but with some variation. So in the case of, of Colombia, they're not as, as low as maybe in countries like maybe El Salvador or Guatemala. Um, but you have some variation in the region, but in, in the main, uh, approval ratings for the United States and for Trump himself have, have come down from what they were during the Obama administration. Um, when's the last time? So last time I was in Venezuela was, uh, was a long time ago. It was about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, 2008, 2009 I was there. And now I was doing research there for my second book. And that was an absolutely different uh, Venezuela. Um, you, one could walk the streets relatively safe. Uh, malls were packed with people who had money. Um, you, didn't, you didn't have uh, a situation in which people were, were in line because of shortages. We go to supermarkets and they, they were relatively full supply. There were some spots, some products here or there, but uh, supermarkets weren't filled with empty shelves. Um, there was, you met, I met with Venezuelans who uh, showed me uh, their homes that had been shanties. And they would have solid uh, walls and solid roofs, and and for them, they were very direct in terms of what they why they had those things. It wasn't because of the Venezuelan government; it was because of Chavez, and it was Chavez that provided me this. It was Chavez that provided this medical clinic that hadn't been there in the past, but the oil money brought it. Um, and, and so that that identification with these benefits and these gains with him as a as an individual uh, was. You know, it was everywhere. You could see it in terms of posters of him, images of him in their homes, and things of that nature. And, it, and it, for bad or worse, Maduro has not, in no way, been able to have that. He does not have the charisma or the popularity that, that Chavez uh, wielded, uh, at least in part because he's not governing under an oil boom uh, where money is coming in left and right. So, in that sense, it's been a real, real challenge for him to try to replicate that, though he has tried. Uh, he, he more or less has failed uh, to do so. So uh, when I was there, it was different in all kinds of ways that uh, economically, politically, that than what is uh, Venezuela today. How has Guaido managed to stay alive and out of jail? Guaido, uh, that's Richard's question, Guaido has managed to stay alive and out of jail. I, largely, I think Maduro has made this calculation that they, he benefits to some degree of allowing him freedom within the country. And he, given, especially we got about over almost 60 countries around the world, including much of Western Europe, the United States, that have recognized Guaido as the president of Venezuela. Um, he has calculated that to have that guy have harm caused to him, to have him be hurt or killed in some way, it would then, the level of reaction would be, would be substantial. Um, and beyond what he's dealing with now. This seems to be the calculation. I think at least in part, also him being there, uh, at least he can demonstrate, look, 
what, what, what authoritarian system do I have? There's Guaido walking the streets of Caracas. There he is engaging in a protest. Uh, there he is criticizing the government publicly. But as long as that opposition, he doesn't view it as a threat, and so far it hasn't gotten to the point where it's ready to remove him from power, he's willing to tolerate his space. But right? you think about those costs of tolerating or not the opposition, he's willing to tolerate a degree of criticism, a degree of protest, um, without uh, dealing with maybe more repressively against those actors, and particularly against Guaido. Um, Guaido himself gets a lot of protection from getting this mantle of recognition from the United States that I think from Maduro may escalate too, things too much from the international community. Is Guaido back in Venezuela, Priscilla? Yes, he is. Is he free? Yes, he is free to leave and re-enter the country. He just, he just he, like I said, it was a couple of months he was out of the country in the early part of the year and he went back in March and he's there, he's there now. Uh, does the large number of refugees in Colombia give their current government a huge incentive to find a way to normalize the situation? I mean, I, I submit so, Chuck, yes. Uh, but again, it's it's a Colombian government is <clears throat> the Colombian government the the government's in power right now. They came to office a couple of years ago, uh, the Duque administration, and their entire campaign. Just to give you a sense of the conservative nature of the government, their entire campaign was: if you vote for the other person, they're going to turn our country into Venezuela. And and, and this idea that don't you dare vote for the left. Don't you dare vote for that other side because we're going to become a, a wrecked socialist dystopia like our neighboring country. So the conservatives within Colombia gain a lot of mileage of alienating and using the Venezuelan government as a, our government does as well. I mean, you, your conservatives in the United States say that all the time, you know, socialism would be Venezuela. Well, the Colombian government has just run, just finished running a centralized campaign on that, on that particular point. So the, the Duque administration is a bit at a, a disadvantage or is undermined by that, how much play and legitimacy he's gained from being the anti-Chavez, the anti-Maduro uh, administration. So that has made things a bit difficult. Um, but I do think that they have some incentives because as those refugee flows continue, that at some point time, trying to stabilize things in Venezuela. Right now, that hasn't shifted enough for the Duque administration to, to move in that, that direction. I would also add the Duque government in Colombia is, has a very close relationship with the United States and a very close relationship with the Trump administration. So in that sense, they have to deal with that calculation as well. They, we, we provide a lot of aid for the Colombian government and its war against illegal drugs, and, and that assistance and that support is one that the Duque administration would not want to threaten or risk uh, if we were to go too far in trying to work with the Maduro government. So a lot of moving pieces that the Colombian government has to deal with, but but I concur. One would think, you know, that at some point that that pressure from that refugee flow would be enough to shift uh, some of their political um, incentives. If I go back in Venezuela, yes, he is with some twenty thousand businesses fleeing Venezuela. How are they with the current pandemic? The issue, yeah, it's 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 been a real, um, it's quite fearful given the fact that people describe the, the medical system in Venezuela as already collapsing. Um, you have hospitals in Venezuela where they don't have regular running water, uh, constant power outages, um, not being able to import uh, certain technology because they don't have the, the dollars to purchase those technologies. Um, the, the idea of the coronavirus within that context has is, is been a real fear. Uh, there have been some cases that have already been discovered and uh, the government has basically immediately responded with a national lockdown, a national stay-at-home uh, directive. Because uh, the Maduro government fully is aware that in no way could they handle, my goodness, we're having trouble handling it. We're, we're the United States of America. In no way could they handle uh, an outbreak on the scale you see in Italy or the scale you saw in China or in Iran uh, without fully uh, bringing down that, that medical system. Um, the people, are people crossing the Columbia for medical treatment? They absolutely are. They've been doing that long before the, the virus. Uh, one can anticipate that as the virus spreads within Venezuela, you'll have people leaving. But of course, this kind of creates another issue. To what extent can Colombia continue to allow, or Brazil, or Peru, or Chile, these are all countries that the refugees have, have been accepted into, continue to allow these people if there's suspicion that, that that virus has spread uh, in an extensive and aggressive way within the population.
question. Um, to what extent they can they don't they have to at some point close those borders and not allow them to flee? I mean, the, the what may be happening or may be coming in the future, it's 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 a bit unsettling to think about um, if, if this virus continues to to spread uh, within within the country. Doesn't Cuba help supplying doctors? Absolutely, as they do in so many of the South American countries. They have, and they have for, for many years. And so Cubans have sent uh, doctors to, to assist them, um, but again, not sufficient to make up for, for what, they, what they have lost in terms of the physicians that have, that have left the, the country. But uh, yeah, in exchange for oil, in exchange for cheap oil, during the Chavez years, as well as today, uh, there's been an ongoing arrangement where uh, Cuba will send medical specialists uh, into Venezuela, and um, Venezuela will, will send cheap oil. That, that, that's been an issue, though, for Cuban doctors, uh, for Cubans as well, because when Cuban doctors, I was in Cuba, I took a group of students from my, my university, we went to a, a, a trip to, uh, to Cuba, and we spent a week there, and we met with, with some Cuban doctors who've been on these missions, and they very much talked about how um, unsettling being in Venezuela is because of the crime and the violence, and the extent that you know, Cuban doctors have been killed uh, because of some of this violence, because the Cuban doctors typically are got, sent to some of the most marginalized uh, parts of the country. And so they usually are places that are pretty dangerous for, for those doctors. So, so even though Cuba prizes this relationship with Venezuela because they need the, the cheap energy, um, there have been some real costs um, for, for the actual uh, men and women who have been part of those medical teams uh, in the country. Doesn't Cuba help supplying doctors? So yeah, so so they do. They continue to do so. Um, and again, they provide uh, military intelligence, military training. Uh, Cubans are, are playing roles in all kinds of different ways within the country uh, as a as a part of this this exchange that's been going on now for, for well over a decade. All right, we don't seem to have another question in the queue. Uh, Richard, your mic is on. Uh-huh. Um, well, if you were to, uh, to sum up, William, by making a prediction as to how long the government's going to last um, and what will ultimately cause it to collapse if it does, well, of course it will at some point. At some point. Um, well, I want to want to go back to Barani's point and, and the role of the military and the the issue more so that I think even the Maduro's calculations, the extent that that military is convinced that um, it makes sense to support that opposition. Um, I don't I don't believe that it, the United States is going to have success. Or the opposition is going to have success through tightening um, the situation in Venezuela. Um, and, and thus, this, the opposition needs to, to shift that, its, its position, its perspective. So when I think about this upcoming election in the United States, for example, this idea of coming back to a, a government that is less hard-lined than the Trump administration, if we do have a democratic government that doesn't view uh, uh, this, this intensive pressure uh, as being the only answer, that strikes me as an important factor. If the Trump administration stays in power, uh, I'm not certain we're going to see anything really change in this dynamic uh, because there won't be enough of that carry for those who have power. So I think a lot rests upon one, what happens in our upcoming elections and to what extent a, a more, maybe a more liberal or more open to a diplomatic transition comes to power from the United States. And then two, to what extent uh, that dynamic changes within the military, how they view their cost benefits to finally decide we can no longer uh, continue with Maduro. So what I think a lot kind of hinges on this, this upcoming election in the United States, to, to, to be honest, because we, we play a really outsized role on, on this, this competition between the two sides. If there are no more questions, I suppose we could wrap this up. Uh, with great thanks to you, William Avilas, for um, putting up with uh, the delays and the problems and, and uh, delivering, I think, a splendid uh, bunch of information. 
Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much again for giving me this opportunity. And um, I, you know, I wish you all all the best. And I hope everybody stays well and, and uh, kind of rides out our our, our joint quarantine, <laughs> our stay at home policy. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. All right, take care. You too. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.